I hope something did not happen to her and did not happen to her children. And that was when I decided that it's probably a good idea to just come talk to you guys and just let you know that I've been spending time with Chris. And that that's as far as this got. And that's as far as it got. Hello, YouTube watchers. Welcome back. I'm finally digging into these Kessinger interviews. And to quote Special Agent Graham Coder again, nothing she said makes any sense. This first interview that we're going to go through was recorded in a park, and the sound is horrible. A lot of ambient noise. Her dog is whining. It sounds like they're shuffling papers around, and her vocal fry is like nails on a chalkboard. So I'll be mostly narrating what was said and include clips of her speaking sparingly. Oh, and her father is present for this one as well, uh, as he is uh, in the second interview. And it's interesting how both Chris and his side piece, both in their 30s, meet their daddy with them. So at this point, Watts has just confessed, but Nikki doesn't know that yet. In fact, if you're watching this, the image posted on the screen is the very scene across town as she's sitting down with the investigator. It's unknown whether Nikki just decided to contact police because she was concerned and felt she had information that might be helpful in finding Shannon and the children. And when I say concerned, I don't mean concerned about Chris's missing family. I mean concerned that her relationship with this very suddenly infamous husband and father would be exposed. So she's trying to control the narrative, to do a little damage control. We know that 24 hours prior to the interview, at about 5 p.m. on Tuesday, August 14th, Nikki did an internet search on topics like, can cops trace text messages? And how long do phone companies keep text messages. And just before that, she asked Chris to delete all of her text messages to him and to focus on finding his family. Here's what she had to say. I asked him yesterday to kind of like give me some space because I'm getting to the point with the situation where I am very concerned for his wife and children. And after, like, finding out, like, oh, yeah, and, like, I've also got this child on the way with her and just wasn't very honest with me, I told him, please give me time to heal and please give me time to process this. And he's like, are we done? Are we done? And I told him, I said, no, we're not. Yes, we are. But he doesn't need to know that. I just told him that because I was just, like, trying to find a way to, like, distance myself from him without alerting him that I'm really uncomfortable with everything that's going on right now. Um, you know, I told him numerous times yesterday that I was scared. And, um, you know, I told him that I was scared not because of, like, for, like, my own safety, but I told him, like, I'm scared because I don't know where she's at. I'm scared because, I, like, I'm scared for them. And then I told him, you know, the fact that you weren't honest with me, like, I don't feel like... I know you as well as I did, and that, you know, that's uncomfortable for me, too. Like, this whole situation, it's just, it's scary. It's, it's not good. So, um, I just asked him if he could give me some space, and then I told him, I was like, when you find your family, and they're all right, I was like, then you can go ahead and text me. I was like, but until then, like, I don't really think it's a good idea for me to talk to you, and that's as far as I've got. But the wife and the girlfriend had something in common. They both didn't know Chris as well as they thought. The following morning, Wednesday, August 15th at 8 a.m., investigators received information from Tony Husky, the security manager at Anadarko. There were several emails forwarded that indicated a relationship between Kessinger and Watts. Investigators had obtained her phone number and referenced it with uh, Chris's phone logs showing they had been in constant contact. They also did a full workup on her and were looking to contact her. It looks like they may have even initiated some sort of surveillance. So again, I'm not sure anymore if she contacted them 
or if they contacted her and asked her if she would meet with them voluntarily to talk. This will probably be part one of three videos, with this one being a bit longer because it includes some background information, but in each one, I'll reference back to the previous interview and we'll see if and how Nikki's story changes once she's aware her boyfriend confessed to murdering his family. And I'm not going to follow this interview chronologically, but I'm going to piece together the related topics because the investigator does jump around a lot. And then we'll cross-reference what she said against what we know to likely be the truth. And for those of you who want to check out the interview in its entirety, I'm going to link below the best quality video I could find. So the interview starts off with the investigator asking when they met. She says beginning of June, maybe a little before that. And they started hanging out at the end of June. And at some point in between, Chris informs her that he has two kids and is currently in the process of separating from his wife, which, as far as she knew, was becoming pretty finalized. Okay, so let's pause and take a look at what was going on in June. We have this email exchange between the two on June 12th. Nikki writes, Chris, thank you for being honest with me this morning. Truthfulness is so underrated in our culture. And Chris writes, Nikki, I'm a straightforward guy. Lying just complicates things. I think you're absolutely stunning, and from what I've learned about you so far, you seem like an amazing person. I hope to continue to get to know you better, since we have a lot in common. Nikki responds, Chris, agreed. It is always nice to find people you can relate to. I enjoy talking to you as well. I feel understood. I am looking for someone to build a beautiful life with. Seems so simple, but is so unrealistic sometimes. Build something similar to what you have done with your wife and those cute little girls. I do believe in karma, so out of respect for myself, you, and your family, I think it's best if we keep that friendship at work. By the way, I keep the conversations we have between us. And Chris replies, Nikki, yes, a beautiful life is something that is hard to find in this world, since people always seem to have an agenda for everything. I do believe in karma, so I agree with that as well. Any conversations we have will stay between us. No need to worry there. My work number is blank if you need to get a hold of me in the field. Sometimes email can be tricky with my spotty service out here. I have an early morning meeting and then I'm doing loto for a construction crew on various sites all day. So if I don't see you tomorrow, I hope you have an amazing day. This is clearly the conversation she's referring to when she says earlier that Chris informed her about his family. It also seems to indicate that even if Nikki started this, Chris was going to finish it. She cracked the door open and he busted through. We can see 10 days after this exchange, Chris goes on a four-day getaway to San Diego with his wife. And they're looking very cozy in these Facebook posts and very much together. I wonder if or what he told Nikki about it. We also see some recovered text messages between the two starting on June 27th, the day after his family leaves for North Carolina. He tells Nikki he's all about truth and honesty, and he says something about not being able to see each other as often as before. So I'm wondering how much they were seeing each other prior to that. I'm going to assume it has something to do with his work schedule because it wasn't always a 9 to 5, Monday to Friday type of deal, as Ronnie would say. And Watts is already saying on June 29th that he's addicted to her also and will miss sleeping next to her warm body. It appears an intimate relationship between the two started on June 27th, where Nikki notes on her timeline of events that Chris brought condoms to her house and 
one of the two boxes was opened and partially used. She questions Chris on why he has an open box of condoms. Odd for a married man, I suppose. She then checks the expiration date and does some extensive research on the lifespan and probable manufacture date. It looks like she wasn't so sure about Chris being so straightforward and truthful, but I suppose she rationalized things and brushed off that woman's intuition. The investigator follows up and asks if there were any discussions of where the relationship was going. Here is Nikki in her own words. I think that he was looking for a relationship with me. Um, but I knew that he was in the process of a separation. So for me, I was kind of having a hard time with that where it's like, you know, cause he, he told me, Oh, we're putting the house up for sale. We're putting the house up for sale. Um, and I told him, you know, I'm not comfortable with, with considering my significant other and vice versa while you are still like, in the midst of a divorce like i was like you know once you and her are finalized with the divorce i'm like once you and your kids have your new location that you wanted to move to set up once all of that is where it needs to be i'm like then you and me can talk about you know eventually like dating she was having a difficult time but we see in this text from june 30th She suggests a weekend getaway and apparently decides, screw the karma and respect for your family. It won't bother me. I'm not going to stop seeing you. I've made up my mind. Are we bad people? So yeah, she got over that discomfort pretty fast. And then she tells the investigator that things started to get serious at the beginning of July. So I guess before that it was just a little pee and vagee. And that's as far as it got. Next, the investigator asks Nikki. And actually, no, now she's officially side piece based on the previous information. So he asks her to walk him through any contact she had with Chris on Monday, August 13th, the day his family was discovered missing. She says they exchanged some trivial texts earlier in the day, but when she arrived home from work, he sent a text message message saying she was gone and that he didn't know where she was. Side piece continues, it didn't set off any alarms in my head. I have friends, I text, and if I don't hear from them for several hours or even days, I'm not concerned. So she seems to forget we're not talking about her single friends passed out on the sofa recovering from a weekend bender. It's a pregnant woman and two young children. And later on, Nikki says she was convinced she probably just left for the day and speculated that she just needed a break from Chris. She says, at least that's how I had it in my head. Meanwhile, Shanann was away for the whole weekend without Chris. Not to mention in the six weeks prior, she had only seen her husband the one week, so I don't know how she figures she needed a break from him. So when the investigator asks Nikki what time Chris messaged her about the disappearance, she can't say exactly what the time was because, in her words, Honestly, I'm kind of upset with him right now, just disappointed with him. So I deleted all of his texts. So she deletes the messages because she's kind of upset with him right now. And did she do that before or after she searched, can police trace these messages? And did she do that because she was worried about what they would find? Or because she thought, damn, maybe those text messages would have been helpful to the investigation? I wish I hadn't done that because of my great concern for her and her children. Side piece continues to hypothesize that since they're separating, maybe she decided to take the kids 
Maybe she decided to leave for a few days. I don't know, she says. I felt that maybe she was trying to get some space, and I figured maybe that's why she left her stuff there, to get some quiet. Again, if you want to get some quiet, you don't take two toddlers with you. But she says it was concerning for her the next day when people still didn't know where she was. And Side Piece says she hopes that nothing happened to her and her children. The overarching theme during this interview is that she's very concerned for this woman and her children, or his wife and his children. She refers to Shanann and the girls in various ways, any way other than by name. But I'm not going to sit here and parse words because I don't really think that is relevant. But I thought I'd bring it up because I know some viewers will take issue with that. The investigator asks if Chris was in love with her. And she says a couple of weeks ago, he said he loved her. But she wasn't there yet. She was waiting to see how things played out with his wife and the whole separation thing. To which the investigator asks again, was there any discussion of the future? Here's her response. I told him, I was like, if we're going to build a relationship, one thing is that if you're getting a divorce, you've been married for a long time, I think it would be wise for you to spend a lot of time on your own. I was like, and I pre I recently got out of a relationship earlier this year, and I think it's also healthy for me to spend time on my own. And I told him, I was like, you know, like, I I respect, like, monogamy. I forget the situation, but, like, but um, at the end of the day, it's like, you need space. And I would tell him that. It's like, you know, once you guys, all your paperwork's finalized and you guys have decided to separate and you're in your own spot with your kids, I was like, I think the days that you're with your kids, you need to be with them, like, full-time. You know, I'm not ready to meet your children. He didn't even ask me to meet his children. I mean, not yet, you know, but I told him, I was like, in the future, eventually, if we get to that point where we think we're ready, yes, but I'm not ready to meet your kids. They're not ready to meet me. You're not ready to have me meet them. And I just tell him, you know, like, I think we should take our time. Like, ideally, I would only like to hang out with you, like, two people, you know, on the days that you don't have and I was like, in the rest of those days, I was like, spend time with yourself, man. I was like, you've been in a relationship for a really long time. Like, just spend time, like, doing whatever it is that you do that makes you happy, you know? And 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 really try to, like, take a responsible approach. So she had things pretty well mapped out for him. She went from hanging out and spending time together, and that's as far as it got, to we say I love you and we talk about the future like all couples do, to, according to Chris, giving him a key to her place the day after he returned from Colorado. And she says she wanted him to spend time on his own, to find himself. She didn't want to see him all the time, yet we know she would get upset when he answered a call or replied to a text from his wife during their time together. She didn't like feeling like the second fiddle, yet they spent every weekend together. By his account, he barely went home during the month of July. So it seems she couldn't get enough of him. Next is the I'm such a good person segment of the interview where Side piece shows how she was looking for apartments for Chris, making sure they were in a safe area with lots of amenities for his kiddos, and centrally located so he would be close to his ex-wife, and so he could have a good working relationship with her. She says, I wanted to help him with the transition and to be a good dad. The other I'm such a good person moment is when she's at the Watts residence. She looks around and has the following suggestion for Chris. I had no desire to go over there. I mean, that's like a situation where he's living with somebody that like, he's separated from. That it's not my life. Like, that's their life, you know? And that's why I tell him, like, the time you spend with me, you spend at my house because this is our space. And that's not my space. And for me, I think it's really disrespectful to go over there. And so um, we stopped by there once. Like, 
on the way to my house. And I was there for maybe like 15 minutes. And I saw a picture of her holding her kids. She's so beautiful. And I remember thinking, like, God, you're a little girl. You're too. And, um, and we laughed. And I remember telling him after that, it was like, have you ever thought about, like, really trying to fix your marriage with her? And he's like, I don't really want to. And I was just like, man, like, you got a beautiful wife. It's like, she's the mother of two of your kids. And I'm just like, you already have all of this stuff. Like, you already have the house and the car and the kids and the marriage and the wife. And I'm like, are you sure you don't want to fix that? I'm like, because what if you, like, try to start over with somebody else? And, like, what if, hypothetically, like, we didn't work out? Or, or you know what I'm saying? Or, like, just any of that where it's like, you should at least give her the benefit of the doubt. You know, and he told me, like, I've tried to talk to her about all this stuff a few times, and it's just not working out. And I'm like, all right. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're if you trying to separate from her and it's pretty finalized, then I will respect that. But, I mean, just being in that house made me feel like he should he should just try to fix it. Like, I actually, like, kind of stepped away from him for a little while and just kind of, like, maybe, I don't know. I felt like I wasn't sure if I wanted to, like carry on because I'm really with him because I really wanted him to try to fix stuff. And I'm going to guess that she did in fact make that comment and I'm going to guess she made it several times. Every time she couldn't get her way because Chris had to tend to something related to his family and kids. I think she said it in a huff like, why don't you just get back together with your wife? And it must have been quite the as Chris would say, emotional conversation, because she recounts this visit quite a bit differently in this dissertation she provides to investigators a week or so later. Went to his house to drop him off after we visited the Shelby Mustang Museum in Boulder. While at his house, I felt uncomfortable, as if I didn't belong there. He had built a beautiful life, and it made me think that there was still a chance for him to fix things with his wife. I told him I didn't think it was fair to his wife or to me that he was trying to live two lives by being in a relationship with both of us at the same time. Said I think he needed to either fix things with her and let me go, or he needed to move towards trying to finalize his divorce. He said his wife was set on separating, and that so was he. He said that when she wants something, she gets her way. I told him I didn't understand why they hadn't completed the divorce after all these months if they were both so adamant about it. If she wanted it as bad as he stated, I didn't understand why it seemed stagnant. As you just heard, she gives him an ultimatum. And he was feeling the pressure. So another point of interest in this interview is where Side Piece confronts Chris about his wife being pregnant, which... She claims she had just found out in the news. He initially claims the child is not his until he finally admits it. But she already knew about the pregnancy. Let's look back at the events of July 14th at his house as she recalls them. Asked him when he was last intimate with his wife. He told me the last time he and his wife had sex was in May but had told me on an earlier date that the two had not been intimate since March or early April. I asked him if he used protection when he slept with her because he stated on an earlier date that he used condoms when they had sex. He told me that he had not used protection. I asked him if he was lying about his separation. He said no. I asked him if he was actively trying to have a child with her since they had unprotected sex. He said no. I left his house. Interesting how she was quizzing him that day on the nature of the sex he has with his wife. What were the dates? Did they use protection? What was the intention of the sex? We also know this girl likes to Google. Will man I'm having an affair with leave his wife? What is the manufacturer's date on condoms that will expire in 2022? So don't tell me she didn't stumble across the many posts Shanann made of her pregnancy during her Google frenzy. And don't fool yourself into thinking she just scanned her Facebook page and may have missed the 
pregnancy posts among all of the Thrive stuff, you can be sure she did the equivalent of a forensic examination of all of those posts. The ironic thing for Chris in all this was that his side piece felt exactly the same way about him as he did about his family. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He was replaceable to her, just like his family was replaceable to him. She dropped him so fast. She wasn't supporting him, rallying around him, or giving him the benefit of the doubt, thinking that once his wife was found, their relationship would continue. She was quick to dispose of him, just like he disposed of his family. We'll continue next week with the first post-confession interview with Nikki and see how she tries to spin things. Thanks for watching. I hope you like and comment and subscribe if you haven't already done so.